Mr. Downing, who is Mr. Manafort's attorney. Well, first of all, Your Honor, good afternoon, or, or late morning, good late morning. I didn't know if you had any questions you would like me to start off with answering or opposed to just reiterating what's in the brief, but, but I will say, well, I don't want you to reiterate what's in the brief. I've read that. Okay, it's now your opportunity to, it's now your opportunity to bring out what, what really you think is dispositive in some arresting, interesting way. That's uh, setting a, the bar high. I reminisce a lot. The world has changed. I was a student in, in England in the late 60s, and I went to many oral arguments. They didn't use briefs at all in the cases I went to in the House of Lords. The judges would appear in their suits, and the lawyers appeared, and the banisters appeared in their wigs and robes, and they together bent down, pulled books off the shelf, and read cases together and argued about them. I thought that was a charming but ineffective way of doing things. To do things, writing briefs is much more effective but then it kind of renders oral arguments a little more uninteresting. Tell me why you've heard, heard it, tell me why. You've heard him say, I mean, their argument is fairly straightforward. They say, you look at the May 17th letter, it, it says any links and or coordination between the Russian government and individuals associated with the campaign of President Donald Trump. Secondly, any matters that arose or may arise directly from the investigation, which I focused on their investigation rather than the Department of Justice's, but that's a fair point. And then the third one is in any other matters within the scope of 600 dot four of title 28 code of the federal regulations then council appropriately called my attention to the august 2nd memorandum from rosenstein which amplifies that a bit of course most of the letter is redacted but i'm advised that doesn't have anything to do with mr manafort i'm going to look at that myself but that goes on to say whether crimes were committed by colluding with russian government officials with respect to the Russian government efforts to interfere with the 2016 election for president. That was pretty clear by the May letter. But then they go on to say committed a crime or crimes arising out of payments he received from the Ukraine government before or during the tenure of President uh, Viktor Yanukovych. Well, we could argue all day here and not not get very much clarified on whether there's a difference between the Ukraine and Russia. Of course, I wasn't there any later than about 40 years ago. But if you ask the average Ukrainian, they will tell you there's a huge difference. On the other hand, the government makes a very powerful point. Y Yanko Yankovich his operation was supported by the Russian government. He did essentially what they wanted him to do, but he's not there anymore. People are killing each other in the eastern Ukraine. My hunch is that it's Ukrainians and Russians that are mostly fighting. Uh, actually, Your Honor, we've spent a lot of time on this issue for the work that Mr. Manafort was involved with, Mr. Yakinovich. They were very, they were very what? They were leaning towards getting into the Euro Euro European Union. They were actually trying to get further away from Russia. Those were the efforts of Mr. Manafort. For today, I will say that the first comments that you had to, you had has to do with the record. You asking for an unredacted document so you can confirm what has been represented to you by the government is, in fact, true and correct, verified. So the biggest problem we've seen in the opposition to our motion is that this August 2nd memo, I'm not sure what we refer to it as, is the only document that's been provided by the government to verify that. 
In fact, they did not violate the special account, violate the special counsel statute or the regulation. It seems very irregular for them if they if they did not violate the special counsel's statute or regulation. It seems very irregular for there isn't any guidance in the statute. It is it. No, the statute says specifically directed. Special counsel, uh, as you know, the re uh, the regula the regs came about in a response to Congress, and a bipartisan commission decided that having a continuation of the independent counsel statute was a bad idea. They were really bad results. So the regs, as adopted, basically said that to Congress, to the courts, and to the American public, this won't happen again. We have a politically accountable officer of the government, the Attorney General, and we have a specific factual mandate if a special counsel. By, by politically accountable, what do you mean? I mean someone who is Senate confirmed and appointed by the President of the United States. The um, serves at the pleasure of the President? Correct, Your Honor. So could be fired? Correct. Go on. That politically accountable officer now is the acting attorney general because of a conflict or a recusal that occurred with the attorney general. That conflict was necessary for the acting attorney general to look to the special counsel statute and say, okay, I need to appoint a special counsel. Now, what happens next? Under the regs, it says a specific factual description, which you have in one, point one. We, we would agree. And then for an additional jurisdiction, for any additional matters to be investigated, the acting attorney general the politically accountable government official has to grant additional jurisdiction. It doesn't say, sure, go ahead and do something else. It says jurisdiction because unless the acting attorney general conveys jurisdiction on the special counsel, the special counsel has no authority to act. The special counsel is very limited. He has the authority uh, by, of a U.S. attorney to the extent he's been given specific jurisdiction and additional jurisdiction. That second part of the appointment order completely eviscerates the special counsel regulations that require that the special counsel come back to the acting attorney general, confer if he wants to expand his investigation. And then there has to be a determination made by the acting attorney general to grant additional jurisdiction. On the record we have in front of us right here, that did not happen. What we've asked for is for the government to produce the record. The investigation that ends up with an investigation that was being conducted by the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Eastern District of Virginia for quite some time. We have no record of how that investigation got transferred to the special counsel. We have no record how an investigation involving banking issues made its way to the special counsel. We only have, well, let me ask you, so what? In other words, is what you're arguing that the use of the investigation in this case is contrary to the regulation and requires the acting attorney general here, Rosenstein, to be specific about what areas he wants investigated and you're saying he was too general. In this supplemental, doesn't he remedy that in the August 2nd letter? He can't retroactively remedy it. The question is, as of that date, what he did. Does it give jurisdiction to the special counsel, or is it still so unrelated to the specific mandate as to be in violation of the regulations and the underlining statute? That's the question. You, I think, early on got right to the point, which is that this doesn't really make any sense. This doesn't look like it is it's related. Prior cases and there are are cases that involved the special counsel always look to is it demonstrably related. The idea here is to keep a narrow jurisdiction on the special counsel 
to not end up with another independent counsel. When you see B parentheses and parentheses II, it looks like another independent counsel. It didn't even require for Mr. It didn't even require for Mr. Mueller to go back to Mr. Rosenstein if he wanted to expand under parentheses B and parentheses II. It just says anything that arises or may arise that, let's assume for a moment your argument that this delegation is in some way illegal. Why isn't the right result simply to give to the Eastern District of Virginia U.S. Attorney's Office, give it back to them and let them prosecute this, prosecute this indictment. Why isn't that the right result? Well, the right result may be for the Department of Justice to finish the investigation they had started and make a determination as to whether or not to charge Mr. Manafort. But, in fact, this order is defective. Then Mr. Mueller did not have the authority of the U.S. Attorney to, to conduct a grand jury investigation, to get search warrants, or to return and sign an indictment. All right, I think I understand. Is there anything else you want me to... We may we make I think one point for the court and I think it's an important point. The government has argued initially that these matters arose during their investigation. I think the government is now admitting no they didn't. That's a big admission and it wasn't in their papers. All the way up to the beginning in the in court here today, I have not heard the government admit to the court that that's exactly what happened. It looks like what exactly what happened. What's exactly what happened? That, that they grabbed these investigations from another component of the Department of Justice in the U.S. You say these investigations. Are you saying this indictment against Mr. Manafort? Yes, Your Honor. All right, go on. So... In their papers, they've been arguing, oh, they came upon this during their investigation. That's not the facts. So I like to make the record clear that their argument in their brief are absolutely erroneous. It didn't arise during it, and I think that matters because their other argument was, well, this whole thing falls into the first specific description, which I think you've, you've pointed out. In no ways does it make any sense that it falls in the first description. Then finally, when you go and look at it, Mr. Rosenstein's memo, it's very odd for when it, when it occurs. But the most obvious omission from it is it does not say, as we agreed or as we discussed. It just puts something in a point in time with no relation back to what happened on or before May 15th. And just one other issue. The government continues to refer to these regulations as no different than something that would be in the U.S. Attorney's Manual or written policy. Obviously, the Department of Justice for some time and the Attorney General decided to make these special counsel regulations. They didn't make it a policy. They didn't make it a procedure. They didn't put it in the U.S. Attorney's Manual. They made it a regulation. And they did it publicly to say to the country, to the Congress, and to the courts, and to the land, that this is how we're going to conduct our business, ourselves. The Attorney General certainly, at points in time, could have taken the right back, taken taken that right back, but he never did. He left it on the books. They um, promulgate, they promulgate, they promulgate that these regs are controlling the office of their special counsel in a public notice, their appointment order. So they tell the world, don't worry about it. We're not going to end up with this runaway special counsel like we, like we've seen in the independent counsel. When they come to when they come to court, they say, "Oh, by the way, these are not judicially enforceable." It's as if they are hoodwinked. They it's as if they they hoodwinked the United States into thinking that this was going to be a di a, a different than the independent counsel. 
I think it's very important for the government to be held accountable, just like the government was and the Department of Justice was in U.S. versus Nixon. You put these regulations out there, you're telling the world, you're telling the government, you're telling the United States citizens, you can rely upon us conducting ourselves in this manner. Then when they don't, and they don't produce a record, they say to this court, they say to Manafort, they say to the country, guess what? It's not enforceable. And I don't think that can stand, Your Honor. All right, let me hear your response. You've already made most of it, but repeat what you feel is necessary. Mr. Dreben, who is with Mueller's investigation. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, let me try to make four quick points and answer any questions that the court may have. First, Mr. Manafort's counsel treats the May 17th order as if it is the specific factual statement that's contemplated by the special counsel regulations. It's, it is not. The regulations nowhere say that a, a specific factual statement needs to be provided publicly and in the context of a confidential and sensitive counterintelligence investigate that investigation that involves classified information it would not make any sense for that information to be conveyed publicly mr manafort's actually acknowledged that in an uh, that in argument on this issue before the district court in the district of columbia the specific factual statement statement as Ms. as attorney general rosenstein described in his congressional testimony was conveyed to the special counsel upon his appointment in ongoing discussions that defined the parameters of the investigation that he wanted the special counsel to conduct so it is not really appropriate to assume that the b in parentheses and i in parentheses description is the factual statement that the regulations contemplate well, I understand your argument, but let me characterize it and see if you find it as satisfying as you appear to indicate that you think it is. We said this is what the investigation was about, but we're not going to be bound by it, and we weren't really telling the truth in the May 17th letter. I don't watch pro football, but I used to enjoy the program that came before where a bunch of players would get out on and essentially make fun of everybody. But they, they would put on a some ridiculous thing and then they would all say in a chorus, Come on, man! I love that. I thought that was great. So, so your argument that you said this was the scope of the investigation but you really didn't mean it because you weren't required by any law or regulation to say what the scope was I understand that argument but it kind of invites the come on man you said that was it but I think your argument goes on and you say look the May 17th letter isn't the end of it. There is the August 2nd letter, and in the August 2nd letter, it's expanded considerably because it then says Russian government in number one, and then it goes to, on to the Ukrainian government, which is never mentioned beforehand. Who knows what else, of course, went on. In any event, I wanted you to be clear how I understand that particular argument. Mr. Durbin, uh, can I take a shot at explaining why I don't think that's the accurate way to look at it? Of course you may. So we're dealing here with a national security counterintelligence investigation that's been conducted by the FBI and that had numerous different aspects to it that were... Are you telling me that in, that in this indictment that's before the court on Mr. Manafort that I'm going to have to go through CIPA that there's going to be a section 4 filing that there will be classified documents you'll uh, they'll have an opportunity to say that they need to say etc etc oh I hope not your honor I was trying to describe the overall well, you're making a big deal out of it being like classified kind of thing. If that's in any way relevant to his defense, there we go with the, another CIPA. 
I have been through CIPA cases, going way back to John Walker, Lynn, and other matters. If that's what's going to happen, I'd like to have notice of it. You all could drag this out. I'm an old man. You could, uh, you could actually outlive me. I'm not trying to do that, Your Honor. This proceeding could outlive me. In fact, if a lot of lawyers around here had their way about it, they would take steps to ensure that almost everything outlived me. Oh, let me try to be brief. All right, sir, that's, that's welcome. The May 17th order could not fully describe the matters that the acting attorney general wanted the special counsel to investigate because they imp implicated people who were under investigation but who may never be charged and sensitive national security matters. As a result, the specifics of the investigation were conveyed to us not on the face of the May 17th order, but in the interaction with the acting attorney general. He explained this in his testimony in just these terms. Simply could not be made public. I think, I think your honor would agree that it's not appropriate for the government to disclose specific subjects of an investigation when those, those matters may never result in charges in a charge and when they could jeopardize ongoing criminal investigations as well as reveal national security matters. That was the only point that I was trying to make one uh, a B and I is not the factual statement. All right. The second point here is that we're we are within the Department of Justice to extent that Mr. Manafort is suggesting that we're analogous to the independent counsel that operated under the old statute. That's not right. Our indictment was reviewed and approved by the tax division, by the national security um, division. We operate within the framework of the Department of Justice. We're not different from the U.S. Attorney's Office in that way, in that respect. We're all part of the same Department of Justice. You resisted my suggestion to have someone here and Mr. Asnoy showed up. When did you ask Mr. Asnoy to join you? Mr. Asnoy is comment from me. This is not part of it. Is um, the attorney that they are affiliated with? Because these main attorneys that are arguing for the for Mueller's um, need to have an attorney that is from the jurisdiction in which they're arguing the case. So a Virginia lawyer that the court that the judge already knows, and that's Mr. Asnoy to join you. Okay, now back to the script. By the way, don't nod or shake your head out there because it's, it interrupts the speaker. It's rude and it has often the opposite effect you may. I, I was never able to do that, by the way. When I, was sitting when, when I was sitting where you are, I nodded and shook my head all the time despite the fact that it aggravated the judges. I did it and I regret that. My perspective is a little different now. I expect you to do what I was able, unable to do. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. We took your admon, admon, uh, admonition to heart, and we are very happy to have Mr. Asinoy join us. Good. I think that's important for communication as well. Plus, you never know. If you have to try this case, you will have to try it before me. Mr. Asinoy has some experience here. Is that right, Mr. Asinoy? Uh, yes, Your Honor. And before me as well, Mr. Asinoy, um, yes, Your Honor. So he can tell you some interesting things. Two more quick points, uh, leave, uh, Your Honor. Yes. First, Your Honor referred to the fact that there are ongoing investigatory matters that concern Mr. Manafort before the appointment of the special counsel. But the investigation that the special counsel has conducted has considerably advanced and deepened our understanding of the matters that have been previously identified. So it is not entirely fair to say that the matters in the indictment did not arise from the investigation or could not have arisen from it because our investigation... It factually did not arise from the investigation. Now, saying it could have arisen under it is another matter. But factually, it's very clear. 
this was an ongoing investigation you all got you all got it from the department of justice you're pursuing it now i had speculated about why you're really interested in it in the, in this case you don't really care miss about you don't really care about mr manafort's bank fraud well the government does you really care about what information Mr. Manafort can give you that would reflect on Mr. Trump or lead to his prosecution or impeachment or whatever. That's what you're really interested in. You know, when a prosecutor is appointed, he's, he's appointed to get an indictment. He's appointed to go after somebody. Somebody mentioned to me not long ago that this is a different scheme. That is not the scheme that was in effect in the 60s and 70s. That's true. But I ex suspect the change in this process is not significant. It's still the same. It's still the same. You're appoint, you appoint a prosecutor, and the prosecutor goes after with the intent, whether it was Clinton or whoever else it was, Reagan or whoever, they go after him with the idea they've got to get an indictment. If you're not, if you don't, they're very unhappy. I remember speaking to one special prosecutor, the Iran-Contra thing, and he was terribly disappointed. That's what prosecutors do. I understand that. The Brits use different system. They don't, they don't use special prosecutors. They use a commission to go out and investigate it and write a report, and then people sort of accept that. In this country, I don't think a commission could do the job you all are doing. It doesn't have the power to subpoena. It doesn't have the power to impanel a grand jury, et cetera, et cetera. I understand that, but it sure is less disruptive. In any event, your point, if I can distill it to its essence, is that this indictment can be traced to the authority the special prosecutor was given in the May and August letters. That, as far as you're concerned, is the beginning and end of the matter. Yes, Your Honor, it is the beginning and the end. And this is your last point, I prom. Uh, uh, and this is your last point, my last point, I promise. All right, the special counsel regulation um, that my friend is relying on are internal DOJ regulations. He referred to them as if they're a statute. I want to be clear, they are not enacted by Congress. They are internal regulations of the Department of Justice. Most regulations aren't enacted by Congress. They're promulgated by agencies pursuant to rulemaking authority. Correct. Congress doesn't do it. Correct. Uh, but he referred to them as a statute. I just wanted to be clear. We're... Yes, I'm clear about that. I've learned a few things. Well, the fourth, they've concluded in a provision that uh, applicable here 600.10 by describing that these rules or regulations are not intended to create any rights that can be enforced by individuals in any pro proceeding civil or criminal yes I have that in front of me the reason for that is that this is the way the Department of Justice to organize its investigatory prosecutorial actions it's no different than the acting attorney general assigned a matter to the Eastern District of Virginia or assigned it to a component of the Department of Justice. It's just, it's not there for the benefit of individual. Of course, the difference is that you did assign it to the Eastern District of Virginia. It wouldn't come, Mr. Eisenhower, with, with a $10 million budget, would it? Yeah, Your Honor, look, I take your point to 600.10, that it doesn't create any rights, but that's a little bit like arguing, look, we issued an initial, an internal things, that, oh, look, we issued these internal things, but don't expect us to be bound by them. I think your stronger argument is you complied with them. I agree that is a strong argument. It it uh, it uh, doesn't. It's no. It's not a very strong argument to say don't hold us to it because we didn't mean it. We said it, but we didn't mean it. 
can I refer to the court to a Fourth Circuit case that the inter in interpreted very similar language and concluded that it was not enforceable in a court? Yes, of course. We cited this case in our brief, and it, it is in Henry Shane. These it's ninety nine seven eight F period two D eight five zero. It's a 1992 decision of the Fourth Circuit, and it concerns the media subpoena regulations that the department has, which it has established in order to put a buffer zone around subpoenas that may not that may go to the media. It's not required by the First Amendment, but reflects the Department of Justice's internal sensitivity to seeking information from the media. The litigant in that case claimed that the department had violated that regulation, issued a subpoena that wasn't authorized by it, and the Fourth Circuit concluded that this was an internal DOJ regulation. It, con it contained language very similar to the 600.10 and the Fourth, Fourth Circuit held this is not a matter for courts to enforce. It's an internal DOJ matter. Respectively, Your Honor, although we fully agree that we are authorized to conduct this investigation, there's no basis for dismissing the indictment. I would also refer you to this case. Wasn't there a matter in New York recently that the special counsel returned to the Southern District of New York? Uh, special counsel's office did refer certainly allegations concerning an individual to the Southern District. Why did it do it? With respect, Your Honor, I'm not at liberty to go into the internal prosecutorial uh, matters within the Department of Justice. Let me ask you this. Did, did it do it because it concluded that it had uncovered material that really weren't within the scope of what it was authorized to look into? Or did it do it because, well, we're not interested in it because we can't use this to further our core effort, which is to get, let me try to answer your honor question this way, Trump. To Trump. Be well, because I want to be responsive at the same time, respect internal internal investigatory uh, equities. I'm not asking you to disclose anything that you can't disclose. We take very seriously the primary mission that was assigned to us by the Acting Attorney General in the May 17th order, which is to investigate, not prosecute necessarily, unless there's a prosecutable crime, but to investigate Russia's interference with the 2016 presidential election and the links uh, or coordination that may have occurred with individuals associated with the campaign of President Trump. We are focused on this that mission. We may uncover other criminal invest activities in the course of that. That is necessary for us to investigate in order to complete the, that mission. We may uncover criminal activity that is not necessarily for us to investigate, but it is still appropriately investigated by a different component of the, the government. We have sought to, res uh, to, to respect that line. We have consulted with Acting Attorney General in order to make sure that we are operating within. All right, that's helpful, but it brings me back to a point that I don't know that we adequately plumbed, and that is why is New York, why in New York did you feel that it wasn't necessary for you to keep that, but it was necessary for you to keep this, which involves bank fraud and registration and other things dating back to 2005 and 2007, which I think manifestly doesn't have anything to do with the campaign or with Russian collusion. You're keeping one and giving up the other. I don't see the difference. I think, I think one answer you could tell me, and I want to say it because I think you would prop, properly be a little reluctant to do it, is it is this. It's none of your business, Judge, why we did that. We're going to proceed on that. Well, I think that's a fair point to make. I'm not sure it's none of my business because I don't have, 
yet a full understanding of everything, but why is New York different? And if you can't tell me, I accept that. Well, Your Honor, I think uh, I can be helpful to you about this case. In this case, Mr. Manafort clearly in, is within the area of investigation because of his affiliation with the campaign of President Trump and because of his affiliation in uh, Ukraine with Russia-associated um, individuals once a prosecutor. Suppose you find a crime that he committed. Let's say the statute of limitations was, say, 20 years ago. Would that permit you to go after him and use it to coerce him or to put pressure on him to turn on others or Trump himself? If it's not factually linked to investigation, then we would go back under the regulations if if we thought it was appropriate for us to investigate and have the acting attorney general decide that. But here are the crimes. Can you tell me how these things in the indictment are factually linked to Russia influence over the 2016 election? Well, they're factually linked to the areas of our investigation because it's trying to understand the activities of Mr. Manafort in the Ukraine and the associations that he may have had with the Russians, individuals. In the, in the depth of those, we needed to understand and explore financial relationships and to follow the money where it led. So the logic of this investigation has factual connections to the indictment. I think your honors hypothetical that would not have been so and that's the functional difference all right i might mention uh, to you that i gone through the indictments as you would expect me to do there's no mention in the indictments that i know of that refers to any russian individual or any Russian bank, or any Russian money, or any payments by Russian to Mr. Manafort, correct? I think that's correct, but the money that forms the basis of the criminal charges here, the tax charges, the bank fraud charges, comes from the Ukraine activities. That's what we're focused on. So we filed the money into the transactions and led to criminal charges here, and it's that factual link that connects the subjects of the investigation in you can't be talking about bank fraud because that's not where money comes from that's getting money from a bank without telling the truth but it could be in the false income tax is that what you're suggesting it's both, Your Honor, because uh, the Ukraine money was used to purchase and improve real estate. The transaction that transactions that are charged as bank fraud extracted that money and made it purchase of his homes. Uh, with money that he derived from the Ukraine activities, we allege that's the factual connection, Your Honor. I'm just trying to explain why we regard this as a connected to our investigation. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Do you have anything else to add, Mr. Downing? Just br this is Manafort's attorney. Just briefly, Your Honor, the one thing that we would ask this court to do before deciding the motion before the court is to ask the government uh, for what anybody who has had any experience with the Department of Justice knows exists, which is the written record. Where is the written record before Mr. Mueller was appointed? Where's the written record about the decision? What do you mean by the written record? Mr. Rosenstein had a process he had to go through in order to determine that there was a conflict that g gave rise to the appointment of special counsel. Special matter that, that the special counsel was going to investigate in any additional jurisdiction he granted. It would all be written down somewhere. That's how the Department of Justice works. Mr. Rosenstein even conceded when he was testifying up on the Hill, he was confronted with the question of when did you expand the jurisdiction to the special counsel? He couldn't or, or wouldn't answer the question. But he did say very tellingly, I will go back and check my records and I will get back to you. 
So you would ask that this court order, so we would ask that this court order the government to turn over those records so that the court doesn't have to guess what happened. What records is what I'm asking you? Well, Mr. Rosenstein referred to records in his testimony. Correct. What records are you referring to? That is, what kind of records? Well, Your Honor, generally, are you suggesting that Rosenstein had to go through some process to conclude that there was some conflict before the Department of Justice could proceed? Which he also testified to. All right, is that what you're the record of identifying the conflicts? I believe identification of the conflicts, the matter that needed to be referred to a special counsel in order to be because of the conflict and <clears throat> the scope of the special counsel's investigation, including any additional jurisdictions. The May and August letters are the scope. That's after the fact. You would expect that the Department of Justice, especially Mr. Rosenstein, would have had a memo before. Why do you, why do you say that? Because in the Department of Justice, generally, just in any situation, did you serve in the department? Fifteen years, five of which was under Mr. Rosenstein's management. Mr. Rosenstein is a stickler for memos being written for there to be a written record for the actions of the Department of Justice. What good would that do me if I had all of that in front of me? Well, it might show you exactly whether or not Mr. Rosenstein violated the regs or whether he complied with them. I don't know about regulations, but let's suppose he violated. Of course, counsel has already pointed out that that's, in his view, irrelevant. But let's suppose it's, it shows that Rosenstein didn't do a good job. So what? So our position is that the extent that Mr. Rosenstein exceeded his authority to appoint a special counsel, the special counsel does not have the authority of a U.S. attorney. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll take the matters under advisement. Did you wish to respond to this last point? Uh, no. Thank you, Your Honor, unless you have any questions. Good. Good choice on your part. I must tell you that I'm exercising uncharacteristic restraint on my part not to require you to tell me about those things, but I think I have an adequate record now. You're going to let me know in two weeks the rest of this letter. I'm going to be interested if CIPA really is invoked. That creates a whole new reg regime for the treatment of discovery and so forth, as you all well know. Thank you for your arguments. They were entertaining. I think I found the right adjectives. Thank you. Mr. Nora, I'm glad to see you here. Uh, I'm glad to see you as well, Your Honor.